Hey everyone, welcome back to Grid Chat. Today we are talking about Zandvoort, which was possibly a very uneventful time, so we'll be talking about other stuff too. Today I am joined by the wonderful content creator and streamer, Ash Vandele. You have definitely seen her if you're in the motorsports space, so I'm excited to have her on the podcast. What's up? How are you? Hello. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. Generally, since you're new to the show, we always start with how you got into F1 and which drivers and teams you support it. So in 2006, I was 13 years old and my parents... Uh, is some context. This is important. My parents immigrated from Poland to New York City, which is where we grew up. So I have dual citizenship. I lived in Poland for a little bit when I was a kid, big Polish family, et cetera, et cetera. And so in 2006, when Robert Kubica started racing, my dad was like, we got to watch. Mm. Uh, if you've ever seen my big fat Greek wedding, you know how that father is. I was like, this thing was this invented by a Greek. The root oh, of this yes. word is Greek. My dad knows. He's like, this actor, 25% Polish, and we're rooting for him. And I'm like, great. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> like, he always knows if a Polish person's doing something awesome, something famous. Recently in the Olympics, the only gold medal Poland got was from the sport climber. He knows everything about her. He's like, I found her dad on Facebook. <laughs> he found this, this like Polish social app. And I was like, all right, Dad. Oops. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, so Robert Kubica train, big hype. Um, still following him through European Le Mans series. He won actually this weekend in the category. So that was a great job and stuff like that. So yeah, nice. really Kubica. I wasn't really team dedicated and never have been. Also, I would like to state since 2006, I've maybe watched five practices. Don't let anyone tell me you're not a real <laughs> F1 if you don't watch practice, okay? First of all, I got I have another, I have a nine to five job. Like I can't watch Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday content all the time. I can't inject myself with F1 24 seven like some people do or have the free time, okay? Specifically for practice, it's fine. Some people are testing things. Sometimes it's cool. Usually it's just there. Yeah. Just don't want, if you watch it, great. If you don't, also great. I don't know where that came from, or you're not a real fan if you don't watch practice or like don't watch this. It's like, Ugh, please. It came from, in my opinion, this like gatekeeping post strive to survive. Like there's like a new idea of like, this is not new actually. I think it's happened in sports forever, but like mm -hmm. there's a concept of like, oh, only real fans do X, Y, or Z. Like there's a hierarchy of fans and it's only the people who want to keep other people out. Like I think I like watching practice from time to time, but like I don't necessarily watch it every single time. I do watch a lot of it, but that's because I'm like the type of person who can't watch anything normally. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I am up in the morning and watching it but I don't watch it every time this weekend I actually did not um I watched the replays for a couple and like the highlights and stuff like that but like you, there's there's a a life that you have to live and I don't think that even if you watch the race some people miss, miss races every weekend that's okay it's okay yeah. you can still like the sport <laughs> Yeah, essentially, I'm pro-choice here. You yeah. choose to not choose to. You know, I like. I don't. I don't care. It doesn't bother yeah. me. I'm still gonna watch the sport. I'm still gonna <laughs> watch my race on Sunday, whether you have chosen to watch practice or not. I think it's wild the gatekeeping factor of it, for the sheer reason. Like I remember, and I'm from. I haven't made it very obvious. I'm from New York. Um, yeah. I have to let everyone know a hundred times <laughs> that when, well, like when I was a kid and I went to Yankee Stadium, when I've been to, unfortunately, I went to a Mets game, um, things like that, mm. that, uh, <laughs> you know, people would be excited. Like, they'd be like, oh, this is cool. Like, you're excited. Like, we answer questions. And like, sure, there's those people who are heckling and being jerks and whatever. But usually, if you're, if you give a hoot, maybe be conservative with my language here, if you care <laughs> about the sport, you yeah. want to see other people interested in it. And I get excited when people are interested. I'm just like, do you have any questions? I'm here yeah. for you. I, like, I try not, to, I, like, I have to contain myself because I'm like, oh, okay. I was like, did you know this? Okay, wait. I'll wait. I'll wait till you ask. I'll wait till you ask. Like, yeah. I was like, you have to, are you good? Do you know what this means? Did you find someone you like yet? Like, I don't understand where it's like, no, don't watch this. Because eventually, I hate to break it to everyone who's listening, we all die. And then <laughs> no one's going to be able to watch this sport if we didn't grow the fandom. So then yeah. your sport dies with you. Like, what is like, how much do you think of yourself that you're like, no, it's got to die with me <laughs> because if I can't watch it, no one's watching it. Ridiculous. I made Formula One famous, actually. I'm the only fan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was us. <laughs> I yeah, I don't get it. I really think like, and you see this in every sport too, and especially with certain demographics that want to keep other demographics out of the sport. I think it's fascinating because you it just is. Say men. Yeah, I could just say men, but it, you know what? Actually, it's not always just men. Like, I do think you have it in everything. Like the WNBA is having this problem too, mm. um, right now, where it's like there are new fans coming in, and there's also a subset of fans that are frustrated, rightfully so, that there hasn't been any attention to the, to the league in the way that there should have been. And 
I get I, I get frustrated too. I've watched the WNBA my whole life, and like I do get irritated when the conversation is only about Caitlin Clark when it's there's so many other players that should be being discussed. But I also don't think that the right way to get people that are excited about Caitlin Clark to continue to watch the WNBA is to tell everyone that they're the worst for not watching it before. They're watching it now. Help them find a new team that they like. Help them find like an, another player that they might like. Like a lot of I've watched a ton of people become Asia Wilson fans that didn't watch the WNBA until this year. And Asia Wilson's been dominating, should have had a shoe deal. I'm confusing so many people who don't watch basketball right now. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but the point being, like, I think it doesn't really matter how you get into the sport when we have this, like, energy of, you know, stay out because I don't want you here or this was my thing. It's like the same way people are like, oh, I've known this band since before they were mainstream. <laughs> yeah. That's like, okay, well, they're selling stadium tours right now. So you've got to just live with it. Enjoy it. Buy the better merch that's coming from it and have a good time. Yeah, I just... I, I just don't understand it. And I, because I can't wrap my head around it in my brain, it just infinitely bothers me why people would do that. You can yeah. just, like, the world is tough out there. Why be mean? You I don't agree. even have to be nice. You can just be neutral. You don't even have to do anything. You could just not comment the mean thing. You could exactly. just not say anything. <laughs> you could just not comment the mean thing. You can just keep scrolling. You can just walk away from the situation. Like, done. Yeah. You don't even have to say nothing nice. Just walk Literally. away. So. Yeah. No, I agree. You know, it is what it is, but it is frustrating. Also, this is a good race to talk about it, too, because I think, like, top line reactions, the one thing I want to say is I have never seen people so argumentative over a radio message at the end. I don't know if you saw the response to Lando saying simply lovely and people losing their minds, talking about how it was disrespectful to Max and, like, all these different things. I mean, yeah. <sighs> It was like the 1% way that it was. Like, he knows why he said it. He's sure. like doing it. But it's also funny, in my yeah. opinion. Like, I know why he said that. And then, like, he, like, poked. But it's also like, haha. It's sort of just like, it's a little bit of trash talk, which is fine. But yeah, I was exactly. like, it just reminded me, honestly, like, when I saw the response to it. Because I was like, oh, okay, ouch, but funny when it happened. And then I moved right, on. Right, exactly. And then the response online when I saw it, like, hours later of people having long conversations about it. I was like, oh, so we're just, like, <laughs> trying sorry, to be what mad. <laughs> What are these long conversations about it that I've missed? Oh, I saw I literally saw someone breaking down like why he knew it was offensive. And they went back down to like when he was on the podium and like cheering his fans on. And there was like an entire conspiracy theory about these two men who are genuinely friends um, and have been completely respectful to each other this entire time about how Lando secretly hates him. And then like, I, <laughs> I just feel like... I don't know. I just feel like we're missing yeah. the idea of trash talk, which is just very normal in sports. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this the way I have in the sentence that I'm about to say. I don't think a lot of Formula One fans would last in stick and ball sports mm. at, at all. Interesting. I want them. I want to give them a Yankees jersey and then send them to Fenway and see how they would feel. And then well, see what that's happens. called committing homicide. So I don't know that... <laughs> <laughs> that's voluntary manslaughter actually um yeah like the like i don't know i there's a limit right like we don't want yeah. abuse like i don't want people sure. to get name called but there is there's a nice trash talk element of it that i also participate in yeah. you know also when i play call of duty um that there's there's a limit right like don't yeah. don't pull those things that other drivers have done obviously absolutely but you could do you can be funny yeah. When someone's like, where are you hiding? You can say, I'm at your mom's house looking at your baby pictures. Like there's like a there's like a funny there's like there's like funny things you can say and do. And it's like the simply lovely thing was funny, was yeah. clever, like you know exactly what he was doing, and move on. Yeah. No, I I am the type of sports fan that screams like they can hear me through my television. So not I don't know. I just feel like it's part of sports. It's a fun part of sports. And yeah. I find it interesting that there's like a lack of understanding of that. I think I don't know. Maybe it's just it's also I'm sure a subset like the algorithm is going to serve yeah. you stuff that upsets you intentionally. They also I think. could just be seeing the extreme things, right? Because like you said, the algorithm could be pushing the extreme things because they get the engagement or the rage bit or whatever it is. So there's always yeah. those extreme jeering comments, trash yeah. talk where it's like, all right, like let's <laughs> slow down there. But yeah, like they're not funny. Nor they're like, I'm reading it and I'm offended on behalf of the driver. I'm like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so I think there's a limit. And yeah. I also think people go personal as opposed to actually talking about skill set and driving and the car and the mechanics. And I think this is like an inherently bigger conversation about motorsport comparatively to stick and ball sports. But yeah, I they go personal as opposed to keeping it like out of In, there. Yeah, very fair, actually. I Yeah, I do think it's like a bigger conversation, but it is definitely true. I would say there's like, I hadn't thought about it until you put it into this 
context. But I do think there is a very different way that motorsports fans in general seem to interact. Like we were saying before we got on, I was like, oh yeah, like I try not to keep it personal. And I realized like that probably is a disclaimer I wouldn't necessarily have to give talking about basketball or hockey or right. baseball. Like there's, I don't know if it's because there's less to talk about or if we know more about these drivers because there's less of them than you would about the entirety of the WNBA, for example, or the entirety, especially of MLB. Like I couldn't name every baseball player in the league right now right so maybe that's why it gets so personal but it definitely is a difference i think to this fandom yeah to me motorsport is a team sport but right they only they're really pushing hard the two drivers that's it when yeah. it takes a whole there's 22 people involved in a pit stop in formula one but we don't yeah. really know what their names are who they are and things like that and that's every motorsport not just f1 but we're just talking about f1 so yeah, yeah it does it does get personal quick but i can i can say that Lando norris hasn't had good starts yeah and i don't think that should be like oh you're you're blah 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 on him like no he just has it but we can talk about why i think it's rear wheel spun for this one mm -hmm. so I, it just it just is what it is i he still won so jokes on me right like yeah. it just <laughs> did a good job mean... there's things he could improve <laughs> like yeah that's it yeah so well let's jump into like pre-race news a little bit um because sure. i realized the podcast has been off since the last race so we haven't talked about quite a few things Ooh. yeah so carlos signs finally mm. signed with williams and i don't know about you we're gonna trash talk a little bit actually i <laughs> forget everything we just said everyone <laughs> yeah i was being really nice and i changed my mind i want to talk about it um i i am fine with carlos signing with williams it took too long and he made too big of a deal about it so by the time he signed it didn't care anymore but James Vowles has been irritating me the way that he is talking about it. Like there was that whole conversation where they there his Carlos's girlfriend was like, what are they like? What? Why are you spending this much time together? Like all these different things. I don't know if you saw that chunk of interviews that came out, but James like is talking about him as though he is the second coming. And I get it's a really big get for Williams. But I do think like we are setting ourselves up to be disappointed next year because there's I don't know, there's just been a number of bold statements made and also like a clear distaste for the driver he currently has in the seat. Um, and it's been a struggle. I don't know. I don't know how to explain this in motorsports. Sometimes simply the timing does not work out. You yeah. can be the best driver in the world and your SOL on timing, depending on other driver contracts, how it is. Carlos Sainz is currently, I think, in that moment where it's just like, man, this is all he's got. He's just got Williams. He needs a team built around him, something where he can lead, which is going to be interesting because people were telling me, Alex Alba, like, is he not the leader? And I was like, I don't see him taking that leadership, developing the car around Alex. It seemed very much like a team situation, like we're happy to have Alex and we're going to make him happy. But I think Carlos Sainz really wants to take that leadership role of helping develop the car and things like that. Do I think Carlos Sainz can do that? I don't know. Yeah. I haven't seen him do that for any other team and really talk about it in that way in interviews. So I wonder if he just wants to step up, show what he can do. I think Williams is a, is a good team to do it in. I'm surprised. I am surprised that he went. Well, I'm not surprised because the other option kind of sucks, but it's like that he has background in it. So I know it's only time will tell, right? I'll give him 20, well, 2026 is a new car, but we'll see how he does in 2025, of course. But we always want to give everyone a year to settle in or such, a season mm -hmm. at least. And then we'll see how he does 2026. Yeah, I feel like it'll also be, to be fair to him, I think he's going to have two hard years because you're going to have the new a, regs. The yeah. new regs, yeah. So it's like, I do worry with everything that he's shifting into, like he becomes a little irrelevant in the next two seasons. Yeah, his, his dad would not let that happen. And he yeah. has so many connections in the motorsport world and such. And I think James would not let that happen because he loves him now. Kind of like Cyril loved Daniel Ricardo. I think this is exactly what's happening here. Yeah. <laughs> he's going he's to get some tattoos. <laughs> Maybe Zach Brown a la Lando Nor. Like we're going to, oh, it's going to get yeah. real interesting real quick about how much he's so excited to have Carlos signs. The thing that I don't like about it actually is I think like in sports, one of the reasons you get into teams is because of the culture of that team. And I think James going after Carlos really changed the culture of the team because he started yeah. to sound so... There was like a period of time where I was like, if you put a quote from James Vowles on and took his name off and asked, did James Vowles or Total Wolf say this this year? I wouldn't have known the answer to that. Like there was yeah. this kind of energy of like, we're moving on. Like I want to be better than everyone else. We're so great. Like this is, it, it just, it had this kind of like lack of, I think Williams has this underdog kind of family run business type of 
energy that fans really find themselves attached to. And I think Alex Albon is a really great example of that. We used to find themselves attached to because I think that's long gone. Because now I don't understand, like, I, now I don't actually understand the, the the attitude or culture of Williams, right? Like, everyone's mm-hmm. pretty clear. Everyone else to me, I understand, like, what, what I'm joining if I were to apply for a job or sign. But, like, Williams, I'm like, what do we, I I don't know if they know. No, that's what I mean. I think that's what this, this has really changed that. This has really been, mm-hmm. like, a pivot from that. And so I'm like, I don't know what it looks like moving forward. Are you surprised he didn't go to Mercedes and they didn't put Kemi in Williams? No. No? Me neither, nope. but it's Next a- question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nope, next like, nope, question. It's over. <laughs> we, speaking of timing, we also have to consider the return on investment when mm. you are, one, joining a team. And Carlos is still, sports terms, the oldest in the league. No, I'm kidding. Um, in sports terms, a little bit older. Yeah. A jo- like a smidge. I understand people are like, he's not that old. I get it. But you want someone who's going to be the, not not like Max or happened, but you want to be someone you can invest in, is rooted. This is who you're thinking of. Mm-hmm. Like we better like Yankees, we better give Juan Soto all the money he wants so he can mm-hmm. be a Yankee forever. And everyone's like, when I think you're a Yankee, I'm gonna think him and not the Washington Nationals. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like right. we're not thinking about that. Um, we want someone who's gonna be there for a while that we can invest in, not someone who's gonna flake after two years or a year and do a like blah 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 contract. You want someone who's gonna be there for a while, happy with the team, you're gonna build stuff around it, develop leadership and all these all these things that come with doing that for you as a Formula One. I mean, there's so much money that goes into this. Yeah. You are one of the two cars that this team has, or four for Red Bull. Um, and you, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, it makes sense. I don't think Mercedes was interested, yeah. nor wanted to be like, he was going to sign in what, like a couple years? Like a one year. Smelly. They're yeah. probably going f- full ham as long as possible. Let's build this for him and kind of like turn that around because they're losing Lewis. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. I think, um, I think I worry for Kimmy coming in so young, not necessarily ready uh, to be at that top level of a seat. Um, and mm-hmm. I also don't know that George is like. I just don't think he's a mentor. Yeah, that that's sense. that's what I mean. Yeah, I just don't think he's. I don't think he's there. I don't think he's at. Versus like obviously, if you had a Lewis and a Kimmy, that's a totally different situation. You're actually able to kind of like mentor and bring someone up. Um, yeah, I agree. A worry for Kimmy, but I get what you're saying. And I, I mean, then it, then it is what it is, right? Then, yeah. then Mercedes effed up. Yeah. It, it, and that happens. Yeah, right. absolutely. Someone is going to comment that it used to not be that F1 contracts were so long and invested in. But it was like, yes, now times have changed, right? You should not be able to shoot three pointers from the logo. But, you know, things have changed now. People have gotten better at the sports, <laughs> right? Like things have oh, like developed. The car has changed. We're spending exorbitant amounts of money, time, effort, engineering. We're going above and beyond. And that's the whole point, right? This is an engineering series, which is why we have new regs. So you can build a good car around the regs, adapt as needed per the location, per the track, per the characteristics. We're going to want someone who can handle it, develop it with us, give us feedback, and then we can work with them for a little bit longer than just stick them in a car hoping to win a championship. No, agreed. You're trying to keep yourself from having, especially moving into new regs, you want people committed for that Mm -hmm. period of time so that you're not building a whole car around a driver that could leave if they get a better offer. I do wish we were more open about contracts here. And that's the only thing that about motorsports that I get iffy on. Like there's a lot Mm. of there's a lot of secrecy that we get as stick and ball fans, believe it or not, even the no fun league. Like we get a lot of information yeah about a lot of things like adam schefter always constantly breaks news about contracts signings bonuses something whatever mm-hmm. and i know exactly someone's gonna get paid five years 33 million this is what it is and everyone's like lando signed for a couple years he's staying and i'm like okay but like how many years for so, how much is he really like why like, i just don't get why we can't have these conversations because i think it's a good conversation i think it's an interesting conversation yeah we don't like pay transparency in motorsports like <laughs> no it's interesting i agree with you because like when fernando signed again with um aston and they came out and they were like it's a lifetime contract i was like well what does that mean <laughs> though like <laughs> Whose lifetime? Is Ken? Like, him? Yeah, it could forever. And lifetime as a driver, lifetime as a mascot. What is the plan? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I agree. It's weird. It's, and there's that very, like, hilarious clip from Drive to Survive as well, where they have the two Ferrari drivers are like, it's, it looks like a Kardashian clip where they're, like, trying to craft a text message. I think it's to Lando about his contract signing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, so they don't even know. Like, nobody knows how to make a move. But you're right. Yeah, it's like, if you want to know what any NBA player's contract is, you can know down to the bonus if you Google yeah. it right now. I just think motorsports is just so sensitive and it only helps 
the the teams and leagues of the league of F1, NASCAR, whatever, to keep the secrets in as opposed to exposing them. Yeah, for sure. There's probably a mental mind game that we just are not aware of. That I guess the other part of yeah, it is Yeah, but I like, like information because I'm yeah. nosy. I just, I just want to know. <laughs> T- Lando, tell me how long your contract is. Yeah, just, I just want to know. Just, just, you know. just send me a text. It's totally fine. We're not going to tell. <laughs> I know I yap on the internet for a living, but please. Who would I tell? Just the entire internet. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, then we also have Jack Duan takes the Alpine seat, which I'm like happy about, but kind of saw coming. Yeah. 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 I think we all saw that coming. We're just waiting. We're just waiting for this confirmation. Just... Yeah. I know some people were pulling for Mick Schumacher and I don't know. I just thought Jack was taking it. He's been there for so long and he's been waiting for so long. I feel like. Yeah. It was cute to watch all the drivers come on to F1 TV after and be like, thanks. You know, proud of you. It was. The I post race show was really cute. Yeah. It was wild that I think they, that they did this because some folks thought about Mick Schumacher was that. Mm. Um, I think they had a picture of Jack sitting on like Michael Schumacher's lap when he was a yeah. kid because he he does have involvement with like the family and stuff like that. Like he he's worked with them mentor yeah. training and things like that. But I was like, ooh, yeah, maybe we could have been. Ooh. <laughs> Jack was the one who posted that. Yeah, I Mick saw is that. like, are you using my dad for your announcement? How dare you on the seat that I could have possibly gotten? Yeah, rude. It's like a little, little rough. I don't know. I guess it's also I think because like Formula One does have so many nepotism like and family connections that it's hard because it's like I can see from Jack's perspective too I do think it lacked a little bit of tact a little bit of tact but I could see from Jack's perspective being like I want to thank like the guy who helped me become right where I am you know it's a, it's a rough one it was a cute photo too I was I think that was the even harder part very cute photo <laughs> Um, and then we've already kind of talked about this but Kimi Antonelli has basically been confirmed for Mercedes seat Toto just sort of has been talking about it as though it's done, which I guess is interesting. He he very much has given up his max quest, I would put it, uh, yeah. in that way. Negotiating with himself on television, it seemed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but do you see Max leaving Red Bull? I think this is like a conversation that people are starting to have because the car's not working as well as it used to, I would say. But I think it's funny because this weekend, Max was like, you know, asked about his 200th race, big milestone. Mm-hmm. Do you see yourself making it like to the next 200? Are you excited for the next 200? And he was like, absolutely not. Like more than halfway through my career as as he phrased it. Um, actually, I believe he fully just said no and then realized right. they wanted more of an answer. And then <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's interesting because obviously Toto really wanted him. There are other people that are still trying to get him. I don't know that he's so upset with Red Bull that he would leave. Right. I I think he's going to stick it out with Red Bull for the yeah. rest of his career, which isn't going to be very long. And I say this because Max understands Formula One is not the end all be all. He just wants to pet his cats. He wants the sim race. <laughs> and then he wants to compete in other racing series. Yeah. He watches all kinds of racing. He races on iRacing, NASCAR, jump, jumpy trucks in the dirt. Like this man loves all kinds of racing. And he's done. I mean, he's won the championships in F1. It'd be great to keep winning as long as he can. And his peak form, which he believes that you or some of us believe you need to be racing in Formula One in like peak form, physical condition, mental condition. Mm-hmm. He's on top of it. He's been part of the team for so long that building the car around him, right? All, all that stuff we talked about earlier. These new regs. He'll stick that out for a while. And then he'll be like, all right, I'm going to go win the 24 hours of them all. Like, yeah, let's go do this. He just knows that F1 isn't the only thing that makes him happy for motorsports. And he's more than stoked to do some sports car racing probably right after F1. And he's he's ready for that, which you can do at like a little bit older. Still to be like peak physical condition, but there's like more of a sports car racing mentality where there's different categorizations from your FIA licenses and things like that. So I think he he gets it. He's going to keep doing it for as long as he personally wants to. So it's more of everyone has to convince him to stay as opposed to him being like the thing I, I actually really like about Max. And we see not a lot of the drivers that are currently on the grid talking about this, but he does. Like you said, he's a fan of other series and he wants to explore other series. Mm-hmm. And I kind of see him as like someone who I could see doing the triple crown like I could see him running for that and it would be interesting I don't know how like I'd be intrigued to see him in an oval like doing the Indy 500 and Mm -hmm. seeing how he takes on a completely different challenge obviously um and I think I think he has that interest in in motorsports as a whole whereas we also see not in a bad way but just like a large amount of Formula One fans and also Formula One drivers see Formula One as like the 
the highest level that you can get to. So why would you go to something else afterwards? And I get where you're coming from. I think it's like you have to train very specifically. Formula One is very specific drive and you can't go back and forth. But I do think Max just like, I mean, he said it. It's not like I'm inferring this. He's already done everything he wanted to do in Formula One. So why would he go through the drama of leaving, starting at another team, going through that challenge? It doesn't seem like something he wants to do. It seems like he'd rather finish this and then go to the next thing. Correct. I'm going to hold some people's hands while I say this. Not everyone wants to race in Formula One. Like that is not the end of be all for every single driver, believe it or not. Um, a lot of folks that I've talked to in Soda GR Cup, which is a single make series, folks, these people were 13, turned 14 on that race weekend. Wow. Started racing in dirt, are now racing in Soda GR Cup, which is a single spec series, to get their names out there in sports car world and start training for that. Because mm-hmm. their dream is to do the 24 hours of Le Mans. Like, that's what they want to do. And like, this is the whole process. Like, at 13 years old, like, they're thinking about winning the 24 hours <laughs> and like getting that sports car experience, road experience, et cetera. So, yeah, for him, growing up a, a big motorsport fan, he wants to do the big things. I know he's mentioned he wouldn't do ovals because it's a little mm. nerve-wracking and dangerous. Mm. But that could have also, the sen- sentimentality could have changed as he saw Larson did, doing the double and, like, the kind of hype around that, like, how cool that yeah. just was of, like, seeing the motorsport series crossover and things like that. And we'll have, um, like, we had Kevin Rankin in a NASCAR, Watkins Glen a couple years ago, stuff like that, where I think he would it would be fun to, like, just get him in a get him in a cup car on a road course and just throw it around. Oh, gosh. I, we, we were talking about this when we were watching Daytona on Saturday night. The Coke Zero Sugar 400. <laughs> <laughs> throw in the sponsor of this podcast. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that the aggressive driving style you need for ovals, like Max would do so well. Yeah. No, he would. I worry there would be some crashing, but I do think he would do a good job. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he would do it, though, meth methodically whatever that word is um, that i can't pronounce thank you so much um <laughs> i'm in a rough morning so right so austin dylan a couple weeks ago crashed out two people for a win mm-hmm. that guy, he got in trouble for that but like the daytona there was some like more like kyle larson was doing some crazy things and like chandler smith and xfinity was doing some crazy things i just think it would just suit him so well I agree. He would just, yeah. I think he'd have a lot of fun. I think he would have so much fun. <laughs> it doesn't have to be noble. It doesn't have to be a super speedway. God forbid Daytona or Talladega. But get him on a road course and he'll be like, wait a second. I can hit you? Yeah, the VP of competition of NASCAR said this is a contact sport, buddy. Like, let's go. Yeah. Like, get you in here. Like, people are going to love that you're doing this. Like, we're going to be your biggest <laughs> fans. We're not going to get mad at you. I'm like imagining him. I'm trying to remember. Now, of course, I can't remember the guy's name. But the guy who um, ripped his bumper off and threw it at the windshield. Of, <laughs> like, I can see Max doing that. I love that. that everyone remembers big ones. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, um, like I can see Max doing that, having a lot of fun. Put him in a league where that's allowed. <laughs> Let him do it. But I do appreciate his attitude in pre- press conferences, which is pretty mm. much like, no, I don't want to do two hundred races. Like, uh, ah, yeah. this is fine. Or they ask him about the Kyle Larson thing. He's like, he can think what he thinks. Like he has yeah. nothing additional to say. Which reminds me of Shane Van Ginsbergen, who's in Cup. He's a Kiwi. He's an Xfinity part time in Cup. Any hoodles. He he got cr- he gets crashed out from time to time. It just happens in NASCAR. Yeah. And they're like, oh, getting his like take after getting checked out in the medical center. And he's like, no, nah, it happens. Yeah, and, like walks away. <laughs> it's like very chill, and people also just like love him for how like lackadaisical he is. So yeah. I think Verstappen would his driving style. Plus, if he just answered questions like, "Yeah, like it happened," maybe that guy could have driven a little bit better. But I'll see you guys next week. Yeah, <laughs> just move on. Yeah, I think he just knows that he's having. He wants to have fun. He wants to enjoy it. Uh, it is a job, and I think that's what F one is kind of turning into. It was a passion project to where he's accomplished what he has, and now like he's getting pooped on for sim racing. Like how annoying. Like yeah. he's getting all this other stuff on social media and from his teams and blah, blah, blah. And this man's like, I just want to race. Like, this is getting, this is getting too much. I think he'll stick it out for a little bit longer than uh, go to sports car racing. Do you think he'll, he has like a championship number in mind? Like in your, do you think he said that he doesn't care about the seven, like hitting the tying or anything like that? Yeah. So feels like maybe he'll just know one day he'll just quit. <laughs> like he's just be yeah. like, oh, I don't want to come back. A hundred percent. And yeah. it's, it's, it's cool that you bring that up for the, for the seven, because I, Max Verstappen is, a great driver, one of the greatest drivers in Formula One. I wish people would understand that Lewis Hamilton is so good, and he is inc- like he. We are witnessing the greatest <laughs> sports person of all time in his craft, and I hate. Oh God, a Panthers fan told me that Lewis Hamilton was dead weight. He's so glad for, for Ferraris. Yeah, I know. It was ridiculous. Oh. He's also a Panthers fan. So, <laughs> so but maybe we should outlaw him from watching sports. I'm starting to yeah. feel. <laughs> <laughs> Some people don't deserve it. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, I mean, we'll, get, well, we'll get into this when we're talking about Zandvoort and stuff, how he drove this weekend. But yeah. it's when we're talking about Lewis Hamilton and all the records he has broken and stuff like that, it is insane how good he is and yeah. how he punches the car above its weight class every single year, even considering how difficult the Mercedes has been to him and for them. He is so good. I hate people are like, he's going to lose in a Ferrari. He's like, you don't get it. This man is so good. We are witnessing 
greatness at a whole <laughs> other level. And it so frustrates me that people are like, oh, yeah, he's fine. Or he like, yeah, he's washed. And I was like, no. He's literally not. You don't get it. <laughs> he's literally not. Max is incredible. Lewis Hamilton is at a different level than everyone else. Like, I don't get what you don't get about that. Like, it inherently frustrates me about all the records he's broken. Some of it goes Lando Norris. It's just, is going to try to break Lewis Hamilton's record. And I was like, I think Lando Norris has to win every single race to like 2032 was the math. Yeah. And I was like, do you? I was like, no, you it's don't get possible. it. You don't get it. I just, I, the thing <laughs> about it is it's the same. I think. I don't know. Okay. I think sports in general, especially motorsports, have a object permanence issue. That's probably not the right term. <laughs> but like perfect term. <laughs> it's like it's like when people try to be like, oh, LeBron James and Michael Jordan, shut shut up. I was about to be very harsh about that. But like it's not, they're not the same. The difference here is like you're talking about someone who's still in the league. Like that's the normally in right. sports and that's another big part of it like normally in sports you are cre- like you're comparing the greatest of the 90s to the greatest of like 2022 or like 2023 versus Lewis Hamilton is not only so incredibly good that he is the greatest one of the greatest depending on how you feel there's only a couple I think you could have the conversation with he's not only that good but he's still going like that's the part that people right. don't understand cannot grasp and then there's the arguments right that he's oh but he's not doing so well i was like what are you talking about do right. you know how hard this i'm saying it, this ship box is to drive do you see what he's doing week in and week out yeah oh my goodness like do you understand how difficult this is <laughs> well it's about also, the car that is like oh i the thing about it is and we can just we're gonna there i had like quality notes and i there wasn't even that exciting other than i'll throw out just so we don't forget alex albon got disqualified which i was devastated by about his p8 and his little his 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 floor is too big (laughs) little floor too big big hip (laughs) But, (laughs) but that was really the big thing and then the but in our conversation that we're talking about with with lewis Lewis is consistently running these different setups that are objectively worse than George's car. Like we saw that in quality this weekend. We saw him running with uh, like a little bit more downforce than George. And so a lot of people are pointing to this like George has consistently outqualified him. And I'm like, yeah, but first of all, there are things about the cars that are being changed that are different. And second of all, George may be outqualifying him, but Lewis is outdriving him. There's no world in which we right. have this many situations where we've we've had so many races where George has started so far up the grid and Lewis has started so far back and they end up directly next to each other. Like <laughs> I that's the other issue I think with the motorsports. It requires so much context. Yeah to the thing right um but mommy jones uh said that a lot of people watch highlights for second ball sports now about like mm. over 50 percent people consume sports through highlights which makes sense because you can right if lebron's just shooting threes all day yeah. Steph curry like you it looks cool you get it they shot a three like this makes sense this is a like five second clip of a sick pass to a three done but like if you have what the is that glock situation you think all this context as to why this was like a big deal blah 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 mm. like this person these points like mercedes mclaren it, mm. just, it just takes a lot more to explain why something is like i can't just show lando bottling the start for max and being like haha and just write yeah. that if you're not a f1 fan right. and explain like this is the number of time but it's real wheel spun but he got this position back because the car actually sucks for red bull and mclaren have figured it out with their upgrades <laughs> there's just a lot of context going into this with lewis hamilton exactly to what your point right constantly yeah. outdrives it's such a perfect way to put it sure you can get out qualified with those different setups and stuff but he outdrives george every single time. And there's a difference when Lewis, Alonzo, and Verstappen talk about what's going on on the track on their radios and their tires than when you hear any other driver talk about it. The detail that Lewis can provide in like an insane amount to like the number of like millimeters of tire degraded. Like it, he yeah. just knows. It yep. is just so good. Max and Fernando, similar. Mm-hmm. Every other driver are like, yeah, I'm feeling it in my left rear. And I'm like, <laughs> and then Lewis will go down to like the exact... <laughs> What's going on? How many laps he has left? He knows. Lando's yeah. still learning this. And that's a thing that I'm surprised about because it's a sixth. So this is something where I get kind of annoyed by by Lando. I don't know if McLaren's developing Lando well. It's on the radio. They're constantly just like, oh, what do you, uh, you, know, what do you think? What's like, what do you think we should do? And he's like, uh, uh, uh like... <laughs> It's like this back and yeah. forth. Like, I, what yeah. is, what are you guys doing? Like, do you not go? And this happens every single race. Like, what do we? Do you not go back after the race and go? Over, I know you do. Go over to Lemmertree. Yeah. Are you not telling him this is how you should think next time? Yeah. If this situation were to occur, this is what you should do because we have these kind of tires. This is our strategy. Blah blah blah. Like, what are these lackadaisical philosophical conversations we're having? Like, it was ridiculous. Yeah. What was the race? They're like, do you know who you're racing? 
Because I yes. think they're telling him that he can catch up to Max, obviously. And I was like, tell him. What is this question? Go. No, I agree. I think, like, this has been an issue that has really shown itself in the last three races. With the radio messages between Lando and the team, I do not understand what the plan is. It feels like, you know, when you're talking to someone that has this desire to make you guess the answer to things, they're like, oh, and why do you like, do you know why this happened? No, I don't. You brought the topic up. You want to tell me the story and you want to have this conversation. Just tell me the fact. Like, what is it? I'm also driving a car at 200 miles per hour. Like, what do you want me to do? Answer the question. And I think that's, we've had, <laughs> we've had it on both sides. It's whether he's winning, whether he's in a battle about whether or not he's going to give the lead back to Oscar like it just it always feels like a thought exercise over do you yeah. know who you're racing yeah the guy in front of me <laughs> on the podium you shall be if you answer these riddles three it's like, like what are we yeah. doing do you have some information that I don't please share it like what are we doing I think you're right there's like a level of like I think Lando is giving McLaren what they need but is McLaren giving Lando what he needs to be as good as he could be mm -hmm. yeah so. and I'm afraid like I don't want my, I love Oscar Piastri so much. I, yeah. I'm going to be honest because people might know me. I personally do not like Lando Norris. Mm -hmm. However, I will give the driver their props if they do well. And he is he is doing well. They got the car. They got the drive. He's got it. There's just like some little things that like he's going to go. He's right. Like the, the communication yeah. thing. I don't know what McLaren's doing. He, excuse me. They should get a tweet. I don't. Like, what are you guys doing? And <laughs> someone's going to type in your comments angrily like, oh, it's the radio. They don't want to make it public. And I was like, they have no other code word for like, what are we, yeah. this is ridiculous. Like, what are these philosophical questions? And then you can hear Lana going, uh, like having to think <laughs> about it while he's trying to freaking drive this car as to your point of 200 miles per hour. Like, yeah. We got to come up with either more better clear comms, a better plan, or mm -hmm. you should be teaching him about how to think so he doesn't have to act like, so we know. The other thing I wonder is like, I do think, and this is not a new thought, people have had this conversation already, but I felt it again this week. I do wonder if McLaren truly understands the power of the car that they have and how much potential that they have. Because every time, genuinely, every time they do well, it that. seems like it's a surprise. Like Andrea Stella at the end, he was doing his little, you know, post-show F1 TV interview and he they asked him what he thought about the win and he was like, I was pretty surprised, very surprising. The interviewer was like, oh, oh, really? Like, were you surprised? None of really? us were. Yeah, it was just an odd. He had a couple of things that he said about that. Oscar. And like, I think it's a good a good watch to try to understand what's going on if you if you haven't watched it, because it's it really felt like they didn't think they would win. And I don't know if that's because they didn't think Lando could get off at the start, which he didn't, to be fair. Um, I don't know if that's what he was referring to, but it just feels like I don't think they believe Lando can win driver's championship, which obviously it's it's not an impossibility, but it is a big leap for him to do, but he could do it. And they're so close to taking constructors. We're at only a 30 point deficit after this race. And it just never feels like that's what they think they're going after. Interesting. I forget who was on the TED Talk, uh, TED Talk, uh, Tech <laughs> Talk with Sam Collins, uh, talking about McLaren and their upgrades in the garage and said, saying that he they bought a suite of upgrades as opposed mm -hmm. to picking out one thing or the other, right? Yeah. And he goes, "This is to our advantage," and like was explaining like why the car is going to do well at a track like this, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, I was just like, is, clearly, yeah. there's a miscommunication in the McLaren team where they're not having that championship attitude or that cutthroat attitude. Yeah. Of like we like we're gonna win this. Like they need some positive affirmations on that Sunday meeting. I don't know what's going on over there, but they need to start doing that, being like, we are winners. Yeah. We will do well. <laughs> like, they need to have that kind of mentality. And I gosh, I feel like this has been a conversation that I've seen some people bring up, but there's something going on in the clear and leadership level where right, they might be doubting themselves or surprised. Mm -hmm. I mean, the tech guys are like, no, this car's great. <laughs> they love yeah. the car. Well, I don't know where the miscommunication is after that. Like, who, like, why are we thinking like this? Where's the miss? Yeah. I do wonder. Also, why are you in Formula One? Isn't the whole point? <laughs> like, what are we doing here? Like, why are you in this garage? Is that was yeah. FP5? Like, no. No, you want to win. I, I do think that actually is a really good way. We, we talk so much about the drivers and about team principles, and we don't always talk about engineers. And um, I like before I did <laughs> content creation and TV, um, <laughs> before I became a big star, uh, I, you know, was, I worked in, um, engineering and, and technology. And I think the difference between engineers and, uh, like an engineering mentality and a team leadership or driver mentality is that engineers know if it's going to work or not. Like there is, it's a very right. kind of like black and white situation. It's like, 
this is we've tested it we've we've run all the math it's going to work it's not going to work there is like when you're on the opposite side of things when you're running a team you're a driver you're about feel you're about like the actual circumstances that you can't control there could be a little bit more doubt in that like okay the engineers told us this is perfect um it's tested this different way but they don't know what it's like when you know someone comes too close to you or the turn's not you know, the space isn't there or the wind's at a higher route about all these different possibilities i just wonder if they're like psyching themselves out because it really seems like the engineering team knows what they're doing they yeah. have consistently since miami brought these changes that have these upgrades that have always been like they haven't brought a bad one yet and it's possible too it's possible that we could be jinxing them right now and being like everything knows what they're talking about and next week it's a terrible <laughs> terrible run but it, it doesn't seem like that it seems like they've really got a team that is sitting down and and thinking about it and knows what they're doing um and on the other side of it you just have the surprise is really like the confusing part to me. I'm like, why right. are you shocked? Lando doesn't seem to be, I will say. Like Lando, both Lando and Oscar seem pretty, I'm not shocked to have won or I am not shocked to have fallen apart. I did these things wrong. They both seem to be overanalyzing themselves. But then you have these conversations where it's like, there's not really a plan. And I think when we saw um, at Austria, when we did not do like a driver swap, I truly, I said this that week too, I truly thought they were swapping the cars to get Lando the extra points for driver's championship to try to catch yeah. up to Max. Obviously they weren't and like very vehemently they weren't. And so it's like, to me, that that strikes as though there is not a mentality of we could win everything. There's just a mentality of, oh my God, I can't believe we're this close. Like we never would have thought it could be the situation. Um I don't know. I'd like to see a little bit more of a winner's mentality because they have the car. They have the car to do it. Yeah, that swap was like a dumb sports decision. Forget about F1 decision. Like, no. what, what is this? Yeah. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's just, yeah, the sport, from a sporting point, it just, I just was like, I don't want to say it in this way because it makes it sound like Oscar didn't earn it because I do think Oscar earned the win. So I want to put that out there. But I also think that it, it was like this, like when you, when you have parent has two kids and they want to make sure they're treating them equally, you know, like, oh, it's your brother's turn to win. Like, it, it felt like there was not a plan across. Like, from a sporting perspective, Lando, you want in as many winning positions as you can at this point. I I take the NFL thing that wins are not a QB stat. I say that in mm -hmm. a context of wins are not a driver stat, specifically mostly in Formula One, because of reasons like that. It is a team effort. Drivers yeah. will win in, like, this is a team, right, team gets penalized. Yep. Things happen. So you can win and lose in the pits. Like, Oscar... Could have mm -hmm. won that race if McLaren didn't F up that strategy and the whole pit stuff and whatever. It's interesting to me when the drivers do well, they did well. We have that conversation online. Mm -hmm. But when they do badly, it's a team issue. It's like wins are a driver stat, but losses are a team stat. Mm. And like I like to say wins are not a driver stat just to get people to think in a different mentality of it's not the driver that's in charge here. Yeah. They have a lot of control, but at the same time, I'm going to go like 60-40 to be honest with you. Because if they pit and the team is like, no, we don't want to help you. They can just sit there all day <laughs> on old tires, you know, right? Like they have, it's, it takes the whole entire team. Yeah. So did Oscar himself drive his very best drive and did Oscar himself deserve that win? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did McLaren deserve that win? Mm. No. From the Oscar side. Yeah. They're going to win either way. But like sure. what the, like how they effed up. The same thing with the, look, Lando Norris's win. Look, Lando didn't do anything for that win. It was a yeah. McLaren win. Mm. McLaren deserved that win 100%. Mm. They crushed it. Lando just happened to be the one in the car. No, I agree with you. I think also like a lot of people, like Valtteri Bottas in his his Mercedes days is a really good example of it. There are mm. races where Valtteri should have won and they swapped for Lewis because Lewis was leading the championship. And like, I think there's an understanding i'm gonna use basketball again we've talked about a bunch of other sports yeah. so hopefully people today are like you know what suddenly i really want to watch baseball football basketball <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's michael jordan actually i would say anybody listening to this podcast that has not gotten into basketball but wants to watch a really good documentary the last dance is a really really good look at someone who is just better than everyone else that's ever done anything um and i think it's a really good look at like the mentality of a champion and what it takes to do that and how lonely it can be which is a conversation we're having with lando now too um and we're having with lewis and all these different things but in the last dance and every other interview that michael jordan's ever given you have to look at how long michael was losing before he started dominating and he has acknowledged a thousand times over that he would not have won his championships without scotty pippen and 
I think it's the same thing in Formula One. You can be the greatest driver in the world, but it's even though you are the star of the team, you can't win as many championships as possible if you don't have the right people around you. So like Max is a, is a an example of someone who is going to lose a constructors championship because he doesn't have the right teammate right now. The car is not doing what it needs to do and Checo is not driving the way that he needs to drive for them to, as a team, take the number of, of um points that they need to take to take constructors, they're this close to potentially losing it from McLaren versus the same thing is happening at McLaren right now. When you look at Lando, Oscar and the team, are they the right combination of people to be able to win a driver's championship? Because Lando could win a driver's championship if Oscar's willing to sacrifice, if McLaren's willing to sacrifice Oscar. Like you have to be able to prioritize in this way. And I think that support is is the part of the team sport that we don't acknowledge enough. Have you noticed, maybe this is just me looking into it. I, mm. I'm going to throw I'm gonna throw it out there. It was just really subdued on the podium. It, it was. was. Just, yeah. Lando wasn't, didn't seem thrilled. It almost, I'm not saying he was. It was just yeah. like, uh, it's like, I'm hungover, just had to do this race. Like whatever. <laughs> it was just like, I just got to get, I just got to yeah. get out of here. Yeah, it was. It was. It seemed very subdued. It just seemed everything sad. did. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, what is? I was like, mm. the yeah. hug with his dad was really nice. Was really sweet. Yeah, I found. But that after cute. that, it was just like he doesn't like want to be here. He like, yeah, <laughs> I felt bad. I wonder if he feels like he doesn't. Yeah, I wonder if he felt like he didn't. He couldn't celebrate this. Like the haters online, or if it was getting to his head, like something was going on. Um, I kind of felt bad. Like he wanted to celebrate his win. He he, in my opinion, he deserved that win. McLaren deserved that win. They yeah. He drove extremely well. He did a great jump. We're all good. Jump for joy, dude. There was no team jump in. He almost missed his hug with his dad, but luckily they like somebody told him he was there. Like he wasn't even looking around for him, you know. And I thought I also I will say love. I did love his uh champagne pop. It was a little different this week. He <laughs> jumped, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, even that. It was sort of lackadaisical. Like he jumped off and brought the champagne with him. Like normally there's a, you know, a good, a big show of it. I don't know. I think I, I do wonder what the team energy is, like what the mentality is behind closed doors, especially. Yeah. And I think that's a conversation everyone's going to have and that is probably not helping contribute to it. Like everyone's talking about who the favorite is, how they're dealing with things. But I, I've never really understood like why teams have this big desire to not identify a, a like number one driver where they're like oh you know our drivers are both our number one drivers like everybody and that seems to be McLaren's kind of mentality you know they're always yeah. allowed to race but it's like th there is a championship that you have to pick one you have to pick one <laughs> right um I don't know but yeah I did feel like he was kind of not thrilled to be there which yeah, I hope he was just I hope like the weather was just yeah what it was he was tired right he just raced this race like he also yeah. had to solve some riddles like I I just hope he was <laughs> Like, I, I, I generally hope that he feels like he could celebrate. I, I hope he was like, yeah. just keeping it back for what the camera or the, whatever, the internet and things like that. I feel that that was a great race for him. He, they crushed it. Yeah. That was incredible. And I think we're going to see it again in Monza. I think Monza is going to be really fun with Williams and um, Laren and such. But we'll talk about that because we have more to talk about for the Zanfort yeah. race. Yeah. The other thing about Zanfort, this race itself was just not super thrilling. Like it was, I was very happy for Lando, but pretty much by like lap 22, he has, he takes the lead back and then continues to build his 22 second ultimately win, um, which is yeah. great. But um, the one thing I do want to talk about is the like starts with Lando and Oscar, because Lando mm. does historically have bad starts. But this was the first time I think Oscar had like the exact same bad start. Lando has bad P1 starts. When he's P2, he stays P2. Yeah. When he's P1, when he's pole position, he, yeah. he always has lost it. But we've seen that happen. I don't think he's... I go uh, I go back and forth on this. I think he's been up there enough to know how to race. Right. It's one thing... We, we talked about this uh, for in sports car racing. When if you are a championship driver and suddenly you're in a midfield, you don't know. Like, you're not as good as you thought you were. It's one thing to be racing on the top and constantly be up there. And it's one thing to be racing in the, and then suddenly go back to the midfield. Yeah. But if you're a midfield driver or like around close to podium and then you're finally up there in that top position, the, ment the mentality is shifting. Yeah, um, a little bit. So in the skill set, too, because yeah. suddenly you're not chasing anyone. You are the chasing of 19 other cars. Yeah. And like, how do you do that? And Lewis has talked about how he like imagines another car in front of him, but he's constantly trying to chase mm -hmm. in um, to keep that mentality up. So, yeah, I think he a couple of times I've seen him lack the experience of starting. Right. He tries yeah. to like pinch Max. It doesn't work out for him. It doesn't work out for Max. It's just <laughs> I think he, he was he's still learning. I think he's a rear rear wheel spun right for this one yeah i think so i don't know if that happened to oscar it seemed like oscar had a similar issue but not 
identical. Like it, I think, and I don't Could know how much still issue. That, he's just, yeah. he's just young. I think he's yeah. just learning. Exactly. I was gonna say, I don't know if it's just really Lando talking about that in a sense of like post race interviews, trying to say like, I wasn't the only one who had a bad start. Um, and like trying to blame it kind of like you said when it's a win it's mine when it's a loss it's a team a team loss so i don't know that there's necessarily anything wrong with the car i think i think they just yeah. again it's something that they need to be drilling for both of them and you can't really practice that outside of the race weekend which is the yeah. issue like exactly. i guess they can put them in an old car if they really wanted yeah. to risk it in like the mclaren technology building and be like yeah. practice your starts like yeah. it's like a drag race or something or that disney channel movie gosh i think it's about the four sisters when they're right on track like sitting in class doing the yeah she's like doing the starts yeah, on the but... thing <laughs> the thing well the thing about this weekend actually was like his reaction time was exactly the same as max so it wasn't mm -hmm. his he's clearly working on his reaction time that's been fine it's just the, the parts after well it's everything else right like yeah, the, like, yeah but it's uh, sure you can have a good reaction time but are your rpms good like yeah. all that other stuff right yeah, yeah. Uh, whatnot but yeah the car uh inherently better yeah mclaren has cr crushed their suite of upgrades that they bought and have been doing consistently yeah it's been the mclaren podcast so we can talk a little bit about like mercedes ferrari a little bit back in the field mercedes i think was an interesting kind of drop from what we saw and this is where we can kind of talk about that lewis and george comparison because mm -hmm. i think pre-summer break everybody all of a sudden was like did mercedes build a good car like what mm -hmm. happened um and then today we just kind of i mean this weekend we just sort of fall apart because we're right back to we need a two-stop when everybody else is running a one-stop um and you see lewis drive incredibly well because we mm -hmm. watch him on that stint on the softs moving from p12 and then ultimately ends um p8 but we also watch george also have to do a two stop and completely fall backwards. Some of it feels like driver issue. Some of it feels like team plan issues. And some of it feels like maybe the car is just not where we thought it might be. It's going to suck driving next to Lewis Hamilton because you're never going to be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, partially, I mean, George can only do so much. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, that two stop was just like I, they had a plan. It didn't work out. They thought that use softs were going to allow him to get past the places he surrendered to Checo, but it just didn't work out. It just, yeah. just sorry, Mercedes. Yeah, yeah. I they think, said it was also overusing the rear a lot. the The balance was off of the car. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is why I keep saying that Lewis being able to do what he did is incredible. <laughs> Yes, and it's not fair to compare him <laughs> to George. It, it's got to suck. But yeah, this is the track specifically where the gaps were exaggerated of the cars, which were working uh, mm -hmm. really, really well, especially their tire yeah. stretch and the tire degradation versus the cars that were clearly not not working. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. It is unfair to get com com compared to Lewis. But at the same time, I will say we got George, no choice. Yeah, we have no other choice. And also George. If I were George and this is just me being a baby, I'd be like, I don't know why you keep asking me questions about why I can't do what Lewis can do. One of us is Lewis Hamilton and one is me. <laughs> one, one is just a little guy and the other one is a seven time world champion. <laughs> And I think like he he does consistently try to go up against it to be like like he was also saying the same thing about Max. Like I welcome having, you know, I want to race against the best. I'm like, you are racing against the best. Like we already know what you can do. <laughs> yeah. George, please. <laughs> um, Simmer down. So I think I I as much as I'm like, oh yeah, it would suck to be compared, I'm like, he does invite the comparison as well. So it's a little difficult to to not do it. But I think like watching the two of them race again like I, I I really enjoy sometimes and I say this about Max too I love watching Lewis Max Fernando drivers that are so much better than everyone else have to fight their way up the field mm -hmm. and seeing Good. the way that they deal with it and I think it was actually kind of nice to watch it was the more exciting part of the race but uh, speaking of thinking of Oscar Piastri when he tries to pass people, which is really interesting because he's learning, right? Remember yeah. when he like tried to defend against Lewis? <laughs> yes. I forgot which race it was. Yeah. And it was just like, everyone was like, oh, and then Lewis was like, okay, bye. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, but he tried, right? Like he, yeah. he, that was like a learning lesson. Like I hope it was a learning lesson because he yeah. attempted to. I thought it was mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. I'm also a huge Piastri fan. Uh, I just think he's good and fun. And yeah. There were moments where he tried to pass Charles Leclerc. They were having that little battle back and forth. And mm -hmm. Charles Leclerc ultimately, we have to talk about Ferrari, right? Because they did yeah. an incredible job. Such a good job. Yeah, I think, I hope he's taking these as like learning lessons. Or maybe he like hopefully went to Lewis afterwards and was like, what would you have done if yeah. you were me? <laughs> and like uh, Max Verstappen at my age was like behind you. Like, how would you handle this situation and things like that? And just take this into account because currently he has these people on the grid that he can't ask, like Max, mm -hmm. Lewis, Fernando, et cetera. 
I think that I think that's really it's really fun to see and compare, right? When Lewis passes, climbs up the grid versus like Oscar just just trying to get there. The confidence, skill mm-hmm. takes. Um, it's fun. Yeah, I agree. And I think also like I do hope he asked Lewis. I don't know if you've seen the like the very cute videos of them racing RC cars together. Um, and I'm like that. so cute. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I hope he is sexy. Hey, <laughs> just just wondering if you have any tips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, it was a sick pass. How'd you do that? <laughs> how, would, how would I have defended better? <laughs> but yeah, let's talk about Ferrari because quite honestly, I was so impressed with Charles. I was so hyped. And I think also the entire time he was like, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> I can't believe this is working out. A 6.11 to a 3.5 is insane for Ferrari. It was a great yeah, race. Great race. Um, And also like not expected at all. Like the car was not, giving any sort of I think the conversation before the race was basically like oh I guess Ferrari's back to falling apart you know like Mm -hmm. it's like at some point people were talking about it like they expected pieces of the car to fall off you know I just didn't expect them to do as well as they did and um even especially like what you were saying with Oscar I think that came into play here too because Oscar could not have passed Charles in, in any way shape or form he tried for a long time yeah, I think you mentioned like right. He had similar pace to Lando yeah. if he needed it, so he could have definitely. We could have been a one, two, three, but just the inexperience yeah. of being able to um, pass and then keep the pass is a whole different situation and battling and not only damage the car, which is like iPhone cars too sensitive. It's a whole other conversation. Um, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> a Charles Leclerc did a, did a great job. Definitely yeah. deserves that podium step, and that was fun. Yeah, it was. I'm also, I will say it's the type of race that makes me excited to see him with Lewis next year because I think Shaw has like a lot of raw talent, obviously, and he has been doing a great job. And I think at the beginning of the year when it was announced that Carlos was leaving, there was quite a bit of conversation about like, did they choose the right driver to stay type of thing of, and I I don't think there was a world where Ferrari was getting rid of Charles and I just Mm -hmm. don't see that happening but I feel like there was such a conversation at the beginning of people feeling like Carlos was the more skilled driver of the two and I think the difference is that like Charles a little bit more consistent in my opinion I think it'll be really interesting to watch him learn from Lewis I feel like there's an understanding that he's not going to expect to be prioritized over Lewis and that it's kind of a career building move for him so I'm excited to watch the two of them be teammates yeah, and a uh, quietly nice race for science too. They, yeah. it, this was, I mean, not every race can be a banger, right? Yeah. Like we're not getting, and also people's definition of banger is wild. People are like, oh, car and fire. Like that's not, <laughs> this was no. a very, if you want to go into the weeds of like upgrades, if you want to mm-hmm. go into the weeds of like skill sets and comparing it to the cars and other people, like this was a great race for people yeah. to watch. Um, we also had V-Carb screwing over Yuki yet again. Yep. <sighs> I... This will always be the Justice for Yuki Sonoda podcast. I really feel like he just is consistently proving himself and consistently not being taken seriously. And I'm just frustrated by it, obviously. Um, and I don't they understand. Flip a coin every single time. I, like, I don't yeah. know what they're doing. Well, and also like with, I, I do wonder how much of it is about the fact that they don't know who's in that second seat, like whether or not Daniel Ricardo is going to hold his uh his position as a part of the red bull family um Mm -hmm. especially with both christian horner and helmet marco this weekend saying that liam lawson will have a car next year though christian came like helmet says it first and then christian comes back and is like but not necessarily with us we might rent him out like and he truly used the word either rent or lease and i was like okay well it's not a piece of furniture um (laughs) and also to who there's only two other seats open so I think it's an interesting thing I think I do wonder how much of it is the team and how much of it is like you know Daniel Ricciardo's influence of uh, connections at Red Bull being that he's trying to prove himself to keep that seat and how much of the team is prioritizing that because obviously there are these moments where he suddenly has like a much better race than Yuki but then when you look at the actual breakdown of it you're like oh yeah well that's why (sighs) Yeah, and this is the same thing with the, the, the personal thing. People are like, Daniel Ricardo should stay forever. And I'm like, they should what, though? They still what? Shitty. Shitty. Um, yeah, markability, great. It just is what it is. I saw someone say that controversially that Charlotte Claire's past is prime. And I was like, I just, it just, I, and I'll, I'll bring this back to Daniel Ricardo. I swear. Yeah. Just, again, this is just like a timing thing, right? You can have a decent driver, good car. Decent driver, bad car. 
great driver, bad car, shitty driver, good car. Like we, we're just like going in these constant scenarios here yeah. of what's happening um, in this combination. And it's funny when someone's winning, people are like, oh, why did I see McLaren cheating rumors this morning? That was wild. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Every. Uh, sure. It's just like, guys. I don't know. I don't know who I'm in. I got to This is why I don't go on social media, okay? I mean, I do, <laughs> but, like, I don't like looking at that fun stuff because sometimes it's just absolutely insane. Um, so, with Daniel Ricciardo, he's made some, personally, I think, bad choices mm-hmm. in his career for moving and swapping teams so yeah. vigorously. Um, yeah. I don't think he has that mentality that you, that you really need. Yeah, I agree. I think, like, I mean, we know why he made these moves, but I think, like, leaving Red Bull was the wrong choice. Then moving into Renault and then immediately leaving there, too, as things were starting to go better. I think I think he had a need to be humbled in some capacity, and he was, but I don't know that he's coming back from it. Yeah, unfortunately, at a larger level, I, I say that he's a system quarterback. He needs a certain car in a very specific manner. He can only do one thing very well, and the type of car he needs is not what he's getting nor is it good for maybe his teammates so the team's like this doesn't work out if you want to run constructors because your kind of driving style the car we need to build isn't good for yuki yeah or right they're not going to build the car for him and so they have max who can they build the car for and things like that so right un- unfortunately not working out for him yeah uh do you have a feeling on if liam's taking that seat or if liam's going to be rented out to someone else <laughs> <laughs> for williams uh Oh, I guess this year, oh. but they're talking about next yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for next year. Sorry. Uh, there was a conversation also of lo- him replacing James. Logan. For yeah. The, um, yeah. Which maybe, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, that'd be good for Liam. Yeah. To get that experience. Yeah, just yeah. to just get under his belt. Um, just being in a race like this and even getting lapped, getting blue flagged. It, uh, believe it or not, it, funny enough, I want to say it's a good experience just to have it. Just know what it feels like. Be like, maybe I never want to do this again. <laughs> I keep driving the car really well. Um, or being a, a team that has a really good car and I can trust them and things like that. So getting used to this kind of pressure and stuff. Yeah, I just don't think Daniel Ricciardo is going to make it easy. And I think that's what's happening. He's not making it easy. Because they're probably like, oh, you can say I was like an ambassador, a reserve driver, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, that's not what I want. I want to be in the car or nothing. So you think it's like a balance of them trying to figure out how to keep the marketing dollars from... Daniel and the actual driving capacity from Liam. Yeah, and the marketing dollars are vastly important. I wish. I agree. Not it's not yeah. the only thing, but it's a it's a nice factor, and and we can have this debate from time to time because we talk about this in NASCAR too with driver personalities. People are like they have the personality. I was like, well, they do, but like, do they have to show it? Mm-hmm. Like, if they're here to drive. They're not here to be you know perform. But like, mm. if you don't have, if you don't, if you're not on social media, then no one knows you. No one buys your merch. No one cares. Yeah. Like it's this whole interesting conversation always towards athletes and I feel like baseball has some contracts or there were talks about it. If they had certain followers or whatever, the team could give you possibly more money. Oh, um, if you bought that fan base over and stuff like that. So I'm um, having those kind of conversations. I think it's interesting actually, like as a conversation overall, like the idea of how much social media following or how much marketing dollars you bring in, in your fan base that you bring to the team. And this is the case in all sports, but I actually find it, specifically it was something with F1 Academy this weekend was our our wildcard driver you know she drives an F4 she has an F4 career but she her her name is Nina Gaiman Mm I forgot to say it (laughs) so (laughs) Nina but Nina also brings a large amount of of social media following because she makes sim racing content she makes like a lot of fun silly content that people find her through first and she brings that audience with her and I think it's interesting to see kind of male athletes having to deal with it as a concept right now because I think it's something that female athletes have had to do as a means of being seen at all in the first place like we see that with like some of the breakout starts from the Olympics like we saw that with um, Alona Mar and we've seen that with Gabby Thomas and and some of the you know the track and field stars there's there's women who have been performing at the very top of their game for a very long time um, I think Zoe Edenholm is also a really great example of someone who's using social media to continue to um, to get attention and to continue to be able to afford her drive uh, and Zoe races in stadium super trucks for anyone who doesn't know who she is but i think like you're we've watched for a really long period of time women's athletes have to use social media because that's the only option and now we're seeing men being asked about their social media following and their ability to be marketable and and the question is like oh should they have to be and i think honestly like that is where things are shifting to like you you do bring a large amount of value to yourself if you're able to bring 
you know, a million, two million followers from social media. And does that have anything to do with how good of a driver you are? Absolutely not. But it does have something to do with how much value you bring to the team when there are only 20 spots. Like when there, there are more than 20 people in the world who could successfully drive in Formula mm -hmm. One. So what do you bring to the table that's more than that? And it's interesting to watch everyone reacting to it when I think it's something that women have had to do for a very long time now. You bring up a very important point in that last section of, right, we hope they all know how to drive well enough yeah. to be in <laughs> Like, Right. When you're applying to colleges, everyone's got the 4.0 GPA and the blah, blah, blah. Like, but you have your extracurriculars, right? Like it's not yeah. just enough to be 4.0, get a fives on your AP classes in the United States. Sorry if you're in the UK and listening or any other part of the world. I uh, <laughs> not, not understanding what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you have your, you, yeah, the, right. Theoretically, you think, oh, I do well in school. I should get into a good college. Well, you're competing against people who do extracurriculars, do things, volunteer at a pet shelter, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah similar thing to athletes and drivers it's exactly your point x number of spots you're all going to be decent drivers hopefully hopefully right <laughs> <laughs> as we all laugh and chuckle as we say that um <laughs> what else do you bring to, what additional things do you bring to the table that yeah comes with investing in you yeah and i think it's like i think that is the conversation that that is centered on daniel but i think also the tipping point that we're starting to have is at what point is marketing more important than the driving right. part so and how you um, keep him and make him happy but he can't get in the car and yeah he doesn't want to race in anything else and yeah so i think uh it'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out but i am wondering if they're at that tipping point now of like all right love you We're gonna have to this. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um but yeah. It was the uh, 20th F1 race with no retirements ever. And wow. Four or five of those were actually from this year, those races with no retirements. So, yeah, it's been actually a little. This is also our sixth race with, in a row with no safety car, um, I believe. Yeah. So that's also I, I, it's almost like everybody's building a car that makes it from start to finish and no one's hitting each other. And I'm upset about it. Yeah. Because what's the point? <laughs> So it's interesting. Someone in the, in the chat when I was doing my watch along was like, ah, this is so great because now we've had enough time to develop. Everyone's getting closer racing. Yeah. And then we're going to rechange the regs. Like, what's the point? And I was like, no, this is the point. This is why it's called Formula Ugh. Like, Formula One. Like, this is Formula One. Like, we're not here just to have close racing. Like, the point is to yeah. be a, a technology based, car manufacturer based race series. And we're going to give you a set of regulations you have to abide by that then trickle down to our everyday daily drivers to build the best fastest most endurance sorry not endurance sprint car in the world open wheel wise go forth and interpret these rules how you will it's an engineering competition essentially exactly it's 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 like a science project you know it's i think mm -hmm. and i think that's actually one of the parts that makes when you're comparing like oh if you're talking to someone and you're like oh would you be a better fit to watch formula one or indycar for example like Formula One is an engineering competition. The cars are different. It's all about how much resources you have. There is an unfairness in terms of like teams that have more money or teams that have less money. But it is generally speaking, like if you like the scientific method, you're going to enjoy the the behind the scenes of Formula One. It is about like, like you said, here's the problem. Everybody go figure out their own solve for it versus a, a series like IndyCar. You are going to have everybody has the same engine. There's only two engines. There's a lot. It's a lot closer in terms of spec um, from car to car because there's less that they're able to change. So I think like a large portion of what makes Formula One specifically interesting, if you are a Formula One fan, is that level of changing things of solving that problem right. of bringing new upgrades and then being like oh these did not work like when we have a car that brings an upgrade and then all of a sudden it completely falls apart that's an engineering like wet dream you know what i mean like oh we figured it out we didn't figure it out now we have to go back to the drawing board that's what's exciting about it i don't know yeah and then to the zanford thing what you're mentioning right it's right mclaren had that new rear wing which is high dive force high downforce wing new floor suspension shrouding Asymmetric cooling layout, new braking cooling layout, all this other stuff. And then mm -hmm. you have Red Bull, high downforce package. They have that in Hungary didn't work. So yes. I think Max was running on like a different setup and he had like this massive wing from like Monica. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know what we were doing. I'm not an engineer. But I'm like, <laughs> but I'm like, this is wild. I wish I was an engineer so I could be like, what is going on here? Like, what are we doing? Yeah. I was like, this is fascinating. And they're like, and how dare every other team figure it out <laughs> those close racing for no yellow cars and no safety cars, excuse me, um, and no cautions and things like that. So um, they have that new, Red Bull had that new air 
duck sticky uppy bit mm -hmm. thing that gave, remind me of the BMW from 2006. Like, what are we? Yeah, I don't no, know what I was doing. It's but interesting too because it's like the thing that's cool about Red Bull and watching like what they're doing actually specifically is like it, from an engineering perspective, they're looking at it and they're saying, okay, we made changes and now those aren't working, but we're not sure which changes are the ones that were wrong. So we're bringing like typically you can't do this entirely in Formula One because you'd be you, you would lose. But it, in theory, you would strip everything back and add everything back in one period at one piece right. at a time. So they're interestingly like stripping back certain parts that they think are the problem and going back to the thing that they knew worked. So you're getting your different rear wing, rear. Why can I not say that word? <laughs> rear wing, <laughs> <laughs> rear wing. But you're getting that kind of older rear wing put back on because we knew this one worked, and now we're trying to find the right combination of other changes. Um, wow. So it's so it's I can't imagine. Um, I, I'm going to release some of my nerdiness. I did competitive robotics in high school. I was the captain of my team. So <laughs> like things like that were really fun because you're consistently doing basically that. Like you're, you're building something, you're trying to solve a problem. The way competitive high school robotics works is that yeah. there is like one problem that the entire league is trying to solve. You get a course that you have to build a robot that can compete on it. And then you get to go and compete. Um, but you're running, you know, tests, you're running like, sort of building a, a mock version of the field and trying different things. And then eventually you try something that breaks everything. Like that is just a, a core concept to any sort of engineering problem. Um, and then you do have to sort of strip it back. So it's the, the high stakes engineering pro problem of, you know, millions of dollars in development and and possible, you know, safety issues. If you mess something up, it's such a stressful, but cool thing, I think. Yeah, I think it's pretty. I wonder if they'll figure it out, right? This is this is fun. But then we get the new ranks, and then we have to do it all over again. Which exactly? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, you figured it out. Try again. Um. So, yeah, and and specifically with listening to Max talk about things after it, it does seem to be a, a balance issue that they are struggling with. It seems like mm -hmm. they've added something that has caused the balance to be to kind of you know fall off. And obviously, they're not going to give us enough information to know exactly what's wrong because <laughs> I know I. <laughs> And they won't release it for a while, and it, and it kills me because I want to know what didn't work. Like, tell me what didn't work on this car in like five years when it's not relevant anymore. But like, they're probably using something from this car in five years that we still can't know about it. I was just like, I just want to know, like, what went wrong <laughs> in this build? Like, can you please <laughs> let us know in like 10, 25, like, unclassify it after a while? I like, I just want to know because it's so, it is cool. They did some kind of, they added some kind of part to the side mirror, it's like attached to it. I was like, what is, what is this going to do? I was like, I don't know. Oh yeah. The little piece. Yeah, yeah. I don't know either because they're the, I will say I really enjoy watching the tech talks on F1 TV. I do think they're, they're really helpful for breaking down those little tiny things that might be making a change. And and these are the contextual things that when people are like, Oh, so-and-so had a, had a terrible drive. I was like, do you know what was on that car that made it so terrible? <laughs> it's like these little, these like little bits. It's like, Oh, he's washed. I was like, is he washed? Or is this car just absolutely terrible to deal with? You know, like I think Sergio Perez is genuinely driving the Red Bull car exactly where it should be. Mm. And it is Max who is making it P2. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very, I think that's a very good point is it's like, I mean, I don't, I don't know that I agree with that at like last year and the beginning of this year when the car was working really well. But I think the car mm. at present, you're right. Like he is driving, driving to the peak of the car's abilities and Max is taking the car similarly to how we've talked about with Lewis, like taking the car beyond where it should be. Um, and, I think sometimes it's like it, that's what it is. It's it's a balance of the exact right chemistry. I do wish there was a way to make the fan base care more about the individual engineers and listening to them talk because I think they put so much like we've talked about, like they are mm -hmm. sitting there trying to figure it out and the drivers are constantly thanking them and thanking everyone back at the factory and all of that. But I do wish we could have like some of that context become more of the mainstream fan side of things where we're hearing people talk about the changes that we've made how that they how they may have caused issues and and i know it's probably more technical than the average fan wants but i do wish we understood that aspect of it a little bit more when we're talking about the nfl we're talking about like new offensive line coaches we're talking about new defensive line coaches like we're we're, we're talking about staff where they come from and what they bring to the table i think exactly to your point we've had mclaren poach a, a lot of good red bull engineers um from below adrian newey who are inherently helping this new car build. Now, I know it takes more than a couple people to build a car, but it definitely helps when they have done that. With Adrian Newey also now working on the car um, or advising per his 
end of termination contract. So, yeah. Um, I do also, on the other hand, like people, like, uh, don't get me wrong, love Hannah. Nice lady. I've met her a couple times. She always remembers me. She's really sweet. Um, the best. Um, people are like, yeah, Hannah Schmidt's strategy. Like, she's the best, which she is. But don't forget, there's like a whole strategy team. Like, I feel bad because like they only talk about her. And I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, I feel like she'd be like, oh, I have like, I have these wonderful colleagues like <laughs> that also assist me with the strategy. Like, I'm really smart. And I know that. But I also have this wonderful team that like we do this together. Like, I wish we would talk about everyone a little bit more. Um, as opposed to just, like just like highlighting me. Yeah. And I think that's the problem with like sports in general. There are so many people, even like you're talking about where we get, okay, we get new offensive linemen coaches on, on, on an NFL team and we see like the impact that they bring. But then at the same time, there are a thousand people underneath him that are also helping all these different things. And so it's, I, I think like it's sometimes it's about like how much you want to know about the sport, how deep you're willing to dive in and whether you just want to watch on Sunday and enjoy the race and then share for your driver or whether you are the type of person who wants to know more about every part of sort of what goes into the car, how many people are on the team um, and why all of those jobs exist. So I don't know. it's crazy how much and we forget that in specifically in the United States, I don't know about other countries. We'll caveat that just how small motorsports inherently still is um, as a viewership and a fan base um, did the math this morning specifically kind of like brush up on it if we talked about it and i was like i think in the united states like 50 percent of americans watch the nfl if not more and like roughly estimate and then the united and for formula one it's like 10 <laughs> and then nascar is like a little bit higher it's like 14 percent just because nascar is nascar but yeah viewership wise like f1 gets like what two million average 1.9 yeah. yeah nascar was like three point something nfl was 18 million on an average, like you're never just gonna stick in ball sports, and then you go NBA, NHL, WNBA, etc. Um, it's just you're just never gonna catch it. It's such a bubble. I think a lot of it is like it is growing for sure, and I think it will continue. I do think it will continue to grow, especially with like Liberty Media expanding into MotoGP and Formula E, and attempting to kind of bring those sports to be a bigger deal in the U.S. Um, but I also think that. The trouble is, especially comparatively to why Formula One can be a bigger deal in other countries, is I think the same thing with NFL. Like, there's a team in your city. Like, you, your fa- your family grows up as a fan of, you know, the. I would assume for you, you're, you know, I I don't want to assume, but I'm assuming you're a New York Jets fan. Um, if you were picking, <laughs> is it my depression that gives it away? <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just like a deep sadness in your eyes. You know what I mean. <laughs> so it's like uh, you have that, <laughs> but like you've talked about the Yankees deeply. Like there there are reasons why you're connected to those sports. We do not have an American. Well, we have Logan, but Logan's on his way out. We don't have like this American. <laughs> driver to connect with and even when we did have an american driver in there's not really like in miami they really did nothing to celebrate the fact that it was his home race which i thought was shocking um so i think there is like a level of like the other countries that are excited about formula one do have a level of patriotism attached to it too like being in silverstone and watching the way everyone reacted to the british drivers on the track um like my section was standing up every time one of the three British drivers drove by, which I thought was really cool. Um, And the emotion of Lewis winning at Silverstone was definitely much higher than Lando winning in Miami, for example, because it's not his home crowd. Um, And so I think like we do lack that with Formula One. And I think if we could have a little bit more, like if Haas really committed to being an American team or if we did have an American driver on the grid that was getting american attention or getting that kind of um respect maybe yeah. I, I think you would have a different excitement for formula one in america yeah i sorry i say that in a way because like i i agree 100 yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and there's also the addition of i just think f1 is not for when i nat stadium they, i don't know if every single ballpark has this i just know because i live near nat stadium when i lived in dc that after the fifth inning tickets were like dirt cheap mm, they yeah, were dirt yeah. cheap sometimes to begin with you want to send the 400 section and then sure. inherently it's more so after the fifth inning you just come in for like 10 bucks if even that right yeah i mean i, I know it's the panther stadium but i live close to it and i could find tickets for the preseason game against the jets for like 10 bucks too but that's yeah. panthers that's a whole other story <laughs> um regardless it's i you can find these deals these tickets blah 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 it, yeah. f1 just prices out i think the average american very true you're never going to get the large amount of it i also think there's no i don't yet 
then people are building it. I'm seeing that, especially in, in women building these communities of mm -hmm. such. Of right, NFL, everyone does Super Bowl parties or like come over for brunch. We'll watch the game or throw it mm -hmm. on in the background. We'll yeah. do this kind of stuff. We'll tailgate. We we don't even go in the stadium. Some people don't mm -hmm. go in the stadium. They just tailgate outside. Yeah. They don't, we don't do that in Formula One. Like, we don't, I mean, you can't, I guess. I mean, maybe you could in yeah. Dakota. I don't know what the rules are, but in NASCAR, you do that. Like, people yeah. party outside the, yeah, yeah. Uh, especially in ovals and tracks and stuff. So, Indianapolis has that big culture with the snake pit and things like that for the Indy 500. We, but F1 doesn't, I think, prices out the average American. I just don't mm -hmm. think it does anything <laughs> for the average American. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where we can build those numbers. Sure, it's still growing, but I think it's going to hit a limit much faster than they probably realize if they don't do something to, um, work with us here yeah i think they're gonna need a, a i don't know i think i will say i am seeing communities build around it like in la i've noticed that a lot of sports bars are start, starting to show formula one races even early mm -hmm. in the morning um there's one sports bar in um it's far from me it's on the west side so i can't even remember the part of town it's in <laughs> i've only been once because it's on the west side but they there's like you know there's one um bar, a bar on the west side that's like actually doing specifically formula one parties i have gone they are packed like to the point that like sometimes they forget to bring you your food like they are very very busy so yeah. i do think there's like i do think there's an appetite for it i just think it's a question of how quickly it can be built and also if like you said like I don't know. I think I think people are are fans of sports that they never get to go see a live game of. Like there are plenty of people who watch the NFL religiously that will never get to go to an actual stadium and, and watch mm -hmm. a game in that capacity. Um, so I don't know that it has to be that, that like everyone can get to a race because by nature of that sport, like you just can't do so. But I do think right. like there needs to be a little bit more um, energy put into like the community building of that type of thing, like watch parties, like being able to go to a sports bar and meet other people who like formula one. Um, I think you're seeing it with like streamers. You're seeing kind of virtual spaces that are starting to build mm -hmm. up. Um, so I don't know. I think like there is a large appetite for it. I just am not sure when they'll capitalize on it or if they'll figure out how to what do so. What they're not realizing is a lot of people start with F1 and then mm -hmm. they go into other yeah. motorsports, which is fun to see it happen to people in my community. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I really do love it because don't get me wrong, F1 is great and all. But if yeah. you're looking for different things, and it, depending on what you're looking for, there's so mm -hmm. many other motorsports that are accessible, yeah, better, for sure. closer racing. There's technologies in WEC and IMSA for talking mm -hmm. about the prototypes. Like there's there's something for everyone. I think there's a motorsport for everyone. Yeah. Uh, is my personal take, uh, depending on what you like or what you're looking for in your sport. Mm -hmm. But uh, F1's a good gateway into motorsports. So I do yeah. appreciate that. And yeah, it is growing. I do wonder if some of the attendees is also like we were fans and we didn't have anyone to talk about it with. And now we do. So we can come yeah. out of our homes. I wonder if it's like a mix of that and how many people. I would love to take surveys. I, I'm yeah. fascinated by <laughs> <laughs> the data. <laughs> do you watch other motorsports? Or do you just watch everyone? Yeah. When do you start watching? Tell me more, et cetera. So. Yeah. And I found I found also I think Formula One is a good gateway sport in general, at least for like for the community that I've started to build. And I, I think like I've watched women basically feel like, oh, I didn't really feel like I could watch sports at all. Like I feel, I, I think that's the negative side of a lot of our stick and ball sports in America, like basketball, NFL, like all those types of things. There is that same gatekeepy energy of like, you don't belong here, but it can be a lot more aggressive, I think, um, unfortunately. And I think like I've watched a lot of young women and women in general start to watch F1 because there is like you know, there's they either they watch Drive to Survive or they literally saw like a funny edit of a driver and they were like, I like that guy. Who what does he do? Like there are so many entry points of Formula One because of how it's entering into sort of the online fandom community. And then they're getting into F1 and they're like, actually, I think I like screaming at the top of my lungs for someone who I can't control to to win a race that has no like bearing on reality or life. And then they're like, oh, well, maybe I like basketball. Maybe I like this. And so I do think there's like because of how it's become such an internet sport there has it has become mm -hmm. a gateway for people to realize like maybe i actually just like sports in general too which i think is cool i think if oh. we watch motorsports or as a motorsport fan we're just masochists because it's just insane how much outside of driver's control there is yeah unlike sports right like you can practice your free throws you can practice hitting home runs and different pitches and things like that right mm -hmm. and to the point where someone at, at that point is just better than you or has <laughs> outsmarted you or has out basketball baseball etc yeah. you sure um 
they just worked out a little bit harder one day or just practice a little bit longer than you. But in motorsports, right, especially in, uh, well, F1, right, the driver can only do so much and the car is just built bad. It's just built bad. <laughs> and you're like, oh, man, that sucks. <laughs> like, it's just, that just inherently sucks. And then if you're in NASCAR or sports car racing, someone just takes you out. Yeah. You can, maybe you'd even see it happening. Maybe someone took each other out in the back and they just spun and hit you. And all of a sudden, like, you're SOL. Yeah. It's, um, it's hard being a motorsport fan because there's so much outside of our control. Um, and they were rooting for the, and it's just like, it just sucks because then it is what it is at the end of the day. There's something yeah. they could have done. They could get a penalty after that, but you're still out of the race and they still get points or on the board. Yeah, I agree. Um, I guess, uh, I mean, we've pretty much covered most of the race. We've talked about a lot of things. The only thing that we didn't, that I wanted to touch on, so I thought Gasly actually had a pretty good drive that we didn't see a lot of. Um, it was, <laughs> <laughs> like, thought he did a good job, was very televised. <laughs> Props to Gasly. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, I got, I have one, I do have my beef with Gasly, but yeah, no, I'm, he did, he did fine. Again, wasn't televised, so everyone yeah. forgot about him. That's yeah. unfortunate. Poor guy, doing his best, you know? Just a little guy, just doing his best. <laughs> <laughs> he's a little French must, dude. Yeah, he's just, just a little, he's just a, a wee man. I thought he did all right. <laughs> um, and then also I think, uh, Aston Martin is, is, I just, I'm a little bummed for them. I feel like after... The start of the year felt like they actually may have had a couple of good moves, and every race it just mm. seems to kind of fall fall further. We had Lance like not even in the points, and Alonso taking tenth. Yeah, this is where it comes together. We're inside, also. I think there's just some shenanigans going. They're definitely not going to be like something's just <laughs> it's just not working for them. Their yeah. sports car racing is going extremely well. Yeah, Aston Martin's doing great. Hard of Racing one, <laughs> and the IMSA <laughs> GTD and VIR. I mean, they're the, their customer teams are doing fine. So yeah. for sports car racing world and for McLaren, it's interesting how like they're different because considering they're in so many motorsports, right? Like uh, they have factory cars and they had in the IMSA race, they had their IndyCar race and they also had F1. And it's interesting to see how like they all did on a different series and just the juxtaposition of all of them, just not having McLaren, uh, F1 did great. IndyCar, not so much. <laughs> IMSA did fine. Rough it, it was just, it was just like <laughs> yeah. a, I wonder if they all talk to each other about what they found out or if that any of the data is relevant across the board of their customer teams and IndyCar and F1 and what they do there, or, or probably not at all. But I like to think that they all get along and sing Kumbaya and invite each other and send Christmas cards. I mean, Zach certainly flies to each one of them, shows up to things. So maybe, maybe he's uh, passing the knowledge around. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe they literally never speak to each other. And they're like, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> we all share one dad and, you know, we don't have to talk to each other about that. <laughs> it's um, gotta be Zach. Yeah, gotta be Zach. Um, last thing that was just like a little one that I w did want to talk about purely because I'm I'm curious your feelings about it. Did you look at the trophy designs? I did. The what did you think? That was with mental health or like the things that the driver. It was it the concept messages. of it was like well so at first when I looked at it I thought they were like messages to the drivers but then I was reading about it and it wasn't that it was the it was not. <laughs> I'm not good enough. No, <laughs> oh my god. Um, well, it was it wasn't like thoughts that they have. It was the artist uh, basically came up with things that he felt like the driver's sacrifice, that was the word that they used, was sacrifice uh -huh. in order to be Formula One drivers. Um, and it's um, it's had a mixed reaction because some of the things that are on the trophies, I thought were, I thought some of them were were good, were interesting things like, basically, like you said, I didn't train hard enough or, or I think, I think the one was, was time like, time spent with family or something like that was one of them that I saw. Yeah, time spent with family. One was like, um, less time for leisure inability to be spontaneous um that's not exactly the wording but it was essentially that like getting rid of Makes the sense. ability yeah and so I was like it, it was interesting to me because I get the concept but I think the response has been sort of like a little bit negative of of the things that were chosen because I think they're like the spontaneity one I get it but I also was like do you mean just because of Sundays because they have quite a bit of time to to do they, they are pretty spontaneous. They are spending three weeks, you know, everybody was in Montenegro running around doing whatever they want. I think it, I think it was an interesting mentality and I kind of actually wish it had been more mental health focused rather than like the life experiences that, that were presented on there, I think. Yeah. To your point, I, I understand what he was saying. Like you've won this because of this, like you've given up 
I, I think spontaneity, I'm thinking of like mountain biking, which drivers seem to have infinity to do and then get hurt and then lose mm. their life. Um, <laughs> it's just, right? Like you can't just go, you have to be careful of what you're doing. Her risk reward factor is a little bit calculated differently when you're a driver, especially in Formula One. Like they can't do the double the, or I'm Fernando Alonso did, but I don't think Red Bull would probably let Max Verstappen do the Indy 500. But they can't do that spontaneous kind of stuff in that kind of way. I guess it's not spontaneous, it's planned, but loosely defined spontaneous. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. what we're going for here. <laughs> yeah, like I, I understand the concept. I just think after winning a race, I don't want to be looking at this trophy on the podium being like, oh, I don't spend enough time with my family. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> I'd be like, damn, like, dude. Ow. <laughs> time and place. Yeah. Um, as an art installation or like as a conversation, and we didn't have a really conversation about it, right? Like no driver spoke about it in any of the interviews. No, like, no PR journalist, anyone asked them about it. No one made a video about the things that they sacrificed, which I think is an important conversation when you're competing at that level. Um, uh, it is an important conversation. We didn't have the conversation. We're just like, here's a trophy that's very, de- like, de- like sad. If you think about it, it's true, but it's like, it sucks. But you won. So congrats, I think, maybe. If you if this was worth it, was it worth it, the win? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> this is your cup of regrets. Like <laughs> I'm, like, waiting for one of them to be like, here's an exit. Like, one of the three that received a trophy walks in next week and is like, actually, I quit. Like, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thought like, about it. I read this and I was like... <laughs> thought about it you're right i don't spend enough time with my kids don't spend enough time with my family miss my dad like <laughs> it's just like i was like it's a i i do get it i got the point i just right was a little i was like this is either really sad really bummer or also certain things people from the from i which i think understandably so we've just talked about like accessibility the cost to attend one of these races all the different things that you can get as a benefit i think some people are looking at it and they're like okay well i'd love to sacrifice those things to have this like i think it 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 did cause a conversation i don't know that it was like the conversation that was meant to be caused or it caused fan conversation where we all speculated opinions blah 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 i wish it was more from the drivers like hey like yeah i do sacrifice this but i love like this is like, this is what we do or like the families came in and were like yeah we do miss so and so on our holiday this is what we celebrate this but we don't see him enough and we love him so much we're so happy to support him like there there could have been more around this where it wasn't like a people took it as like a sad thing <laughs> like a, <laughs> yes because uh, inherently <laughs> to me now it just is like now he's gonna see that trophy to your point and be like "Ooh, am i doing this for the right reasons yeah <laughs> yeah and max of of all people as well who's like i'm pretty much done actually i think i'm you know what you made a good point <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. have sacrificed. I'm sacrificing my sim racing, sacrificing my happiness. <laughs> I don't um, see my cats anymore. I just yeah. What am I doing here? Like that's I am truly waiting well, for one of them to be like, <laughs> like I don't understand what we're doing here. Like I'm just gonna go. <laughs> yeah, like you know. And thanks for the inspo. Like I, I <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. I thought it was an interesting one, and I think um, sometimes I'm also like the other part that is kind of interesting about it is Lando has talked about the fact that they don't actually get to keep their trophies. Like they, they go to the team HQ. So now there's like, there is something funny in the idea of like a trophy that lists all the things that you sacrifice that also you can't keep. (laughs) I think you can order or get a replica. Yeah. You can get a replica. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which I don't know. I would get a replica of that one. Cause I don't want to be like, you are reminded every day by not getting on that podium or like not winning. (laughs) what you sacrificed yeah. to not win like i get like thank you <laughs> yeah okay thanks i remember i remember um but yeah so interesting yeah, again the lack of context that f1 did not provide beautiful story a uh, great installation again wish we had some more social media video something presence talking to drivers their significant others their families yeah. to add more to what these drivers go through because sometimes we, we just i think we do as fandoms take it for granted mm-hmm. or not realize because it's so safe now that yeah. motorsports is inherently dangerous and in what they do put through, yeah. um, go through, excuse me, every weekend and what their families are constantly worried all the time, probably watching them, God forbid. So, um, yeah, good conversation. I just sometimes the Internet doesn't always have that good conversation and everyone could have led it a little bit better. But agreed. Yeah, we are. Yeah, I actually I, that is a good point, too. I, I do wish we got a little bit more personal sides of things, which is probably a, a, a balance there finding the right way to do in terms of how famous these people are how much how much people feel connected to them and entitled to their personalities and their personal lives um but sometimes i do wish like you know every end of race weekend we get the walk and talk video from these drivers of like you know 
you know, wish we could have done a little bit better. Things like, I don't know who yeah. invented the walk part of the video, if that's just the only time they have to film it. But um, I do sometimes wish like, yeah, you have like an opportunity. You're paying this artist. You've come up with an interesting art piece. And I'd like to have the conversation a little bit more guided. But I do wonder how much of that is like Formula One being a separate entity from each of the teams. Everybody not really necessarily having like a group project energy to discuss it. <laughs> but who knows um but yeah and then that's pretty much it the only other point of it was the uh i did love seeing mclaren the one choice they really did make that they charged that they charged their battery for about five laps before going after fastest lap um which they were able to take away from lewis who had put that on fresh um fresh Poor tires lewis. Like a, it was know. like do i need to go for this and they're like you're fine and then the last lap it was like seven thousandths of a second <laughs> he's like should i oh i shouldn't you guys sure about that? All right. Um, but yeah, so I think that was the one thing that McLaren did seem when they had, once they finally, you know, settled into the fact that they were winning for sure, because they were still talking about like, should we open up a pit stop gap? Should we change tires and go for fastest lap? We have a safety car gap. Like there were even, even after they had the win pretty much handled, but they did at least uh, kind of come, come to that plan, which I thought was good. Lando got the extra point. So yeah, Lando did it on old tires too. Yeah, he didn't, he, did. put, he didn't have to put on a fresh set of kicks and just try to yeet his car around. He just did it. And he was like, oh, okay, I can do this. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, their tire degradation was so good. Yeah, it was. It was It was really good. And then I was listening to Ruth talk about it, or Ruth Westcombe, and she was saying essentially like they took the time to charge the battery to be at a 100% mm -hmm. charge to then grab that fastest lap, which is impressive. It'll be like so. 23 seconds ahead of me. <laughs> Un unbelievable. Uh, truly. <laughs> truly. And at his home race, uh, simply lovely, as we said at the beginning. Um <laughs> so yeah i mean i think i think we covered pretty much everything um last little bit that we always do is do you have predictions for next race or any hot takes for the rest of the season um i don't know about hot takes the thing with motorsports is right because it is so unpredictable like yeah. i don't know what's anything could be a hot take <laughs> anything anything could be a hot take and it could also be inherently just wrong yeah uh, i think mclaren's gonna do great at monza yeah um i think we're gonna figure it out there i think williams will do better as well mm -hmm. Um, but mine's is that full throttle for like 80% of the lap, mm -hmm. high speed, low drag. I think it favors the Williams and then McLaren just had it figured out. They're going to do Yeah, fun. Agreed. Um, I do realize, I think it's actually in the press conference after, um, cause I do ask this at the end cause might as well, but they asked Lando pretty much the same question, you know, like predictions for next race. And he was like, you ask me these questions, like we're supposed to have the answers. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> literally don't know um but yeah i think mclaren will continue to do well at monza and i think the one thing i am curious your take on points wise realistically i am curious if you think those seven points that we lost in austria for swapping oscar and lando will come into play it's it's going to affect them either in a small way or a big because right if they're th they're always going to be thinking about it it's always going to be in the back of their head that we're like oh man now we have to do like this man um when it comes down to it, is he going to lose by those points? It's the way things pan out now, right? If it's Lando always getting P1 and Max always getting P2, yeah, it's either way, it's they should have really not have done that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Good guys don't win, and I don't know why you're trying to be a nice person in a yeah. cutthroat competitive engineering <laughs> yeah. racing sport. Um, yeah. In this, in the sense of you mess up your strategy, you got to give it back to Oscar. I, I do think so. Yeah. I agree. Um, I think I I've, I actually really think, especially seeing how Lando came back from summer break, I do think he's in a better headspace than he was pre summer break. And I think it's there's a potential that he could continue to perform. And I think the car is getting to the point that it's just so good that it's hard not to. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's hard to say. Like I I think obviously Max has to continue to not win, and that's just the truth. And Lando has to continue to win, but should anything go wrong with the car should max have a retirement should max um find himself at the back of the grid there there is still this possibility for him to win and i think um i don't know i don't even know personally that i'm rooting for one or the other like i don't know that i'm mm -hmm. rooting for lando to come out of nowhere and and win this um but i am excited about the drive i am interested about it and to see it and, see I, it and unfold. I yeah seeing it unfold so we'll see i think i think uh, will win constructors I think and so they too. deserve and rightly and deservingly so because they constructed <laughs> as we've been seeing the better car. Um, people are like Checo's losing. I was like, no, Red Bull has lost 
yeah. their car. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Max um, is just so. keeping the car together. Max is just <laughs> yeah. continuing to do it. If Max does win World Driver Championship, he, it's because he earned it. He held that yeah. car together and he drove it. You know, so I think um, it'll be interesting to see. I don't know, but we'll be back next week in Monza. So it'll be fun. It's gonna be fun. I think Monza's a fun track always, and the the fans yeah. are crazy. In yeah, a good way. True. I do hope we see Ferrari continue to uh, have a good week. I'd love to see them have a nice a nice home race, but I don't know that we'll see a a win. I'd like to see a, a podium, a little, a little Charles on the podium. That's my goal for next week. Please. Yeah. And I do kind of like this where we are in 2025 will be interesting because right. We always say consistently wins championships and sure P1 is great. Mm -hmm. But what if it's like Lando P3 and Max P2 and Charles P1? And like we're yeah. getting like this mishmash of points every single weekend because everyone's just bringing different upgrades or one track favors the other. I think that would, that's going to be fun to watch. And hopefully that's what happens for us yeah. for the remaining races. Agreed. Um, well, thanks for hanging out, Ash. This has been so much fun. I really appreciate you coming on for a Monday. Thanks for having me. We uh, we, yapped, we yapped a lot and I apologize. Um, it's so good. <laughs> we yapped away. I hope everybody enjoyed the yap. <laughs>